Well, good morning. We will dismiss the children for Children's Church at this point. You may send them off, or they will be instructed in the ways of the Lord. Let me just grab what we need here. Well, <clears throat> being a minister has several perks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> can't go through them all today, but there are a few that I can mention. Uh, one of them is. <clears throat> Very honestly, one of the greatest is when you get to perform a funeral for an aged saint Amen. that's finally laid down his sword and <clears throat> gone on to greet his king in person, face to face. That's a, that's a privilege to be able to, to perform a funeral like that, that it should be actually be more of a celebration <clears throat> and a promotion. Well, the other, of course, is when you get to lead someone to Christ, when you get someone filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to walk in a fullness of power they never experienced before, it is uh, when you can get a chance to lay hands on the sick and watch God change their bodies, change their, their minds at times and different things. Amen. Uh, those are all privileges. But one of the privileges that we also get that Jesus also had is when we get to dedicate a child. And so this morning we're going to do a child dedication to begin with. And if we can, let's just go ahead and get, let me get the names right now. Shabu jo Josie Joseph and Julie Joy Joseph. And they're going to bring Israel Joy Joseph. Amen. <laughs> What? Yeah, come right on up here. <laughs> Israel here was born on November 22nd, 2011. Hi there. <laughs> Isn't he adorable? <laughs> so we get to dedicate him today. So right now we're just going to pray. And I actually have some oil. We're going to anoint him. Hello, Israel. Hi. He says, who is all those people? Look at that. And they're all looking at me. Look at him. <laughs> well, Father, we thank you for this young man. We thank you right now. We dedicate him to you. These parents, Lord, they follow you. And Lord, right now, we dedicate this child to you to be raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord that he will always know peace, that he will know joy, the righteousness of God will dwell in him, that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit at an early age, knowing Jesus as his Lord, that all the days of his life he will proclaim the goodness of God. So, Father, we thank you even now in Jesus' name. So be it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we dedicate you to a life in Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, for those of you that don't know, well, you probably do know, but that was uh, our first baby dedication here since we founded the church, uh, I guess six months ago or so. So it was a milestone. So we're looking forward to many more. Right? We will populate the kingdom one way or another. <laughs> Amen. So, okay. <laughs> So, all right, well, if you have your Bibles, well, actually, before you have your, well, go ahead and have your Bibles, but before we get to that, I want to make a mention next week, and this may have already been said, I just maybe didn't catch it, but next week we will be doing communion. You already had that? Okay, good. So have the elements ready. Those of you watching by internet or later by DVD, have the elements ready tomorrow. This is Palm Sunday. Next, I say tomorrow, next Sunday will be Easter Sunday. Um, <clears throat> So we will be participating in communion next Sunday. So get all the materials ready, and we will have a good time together. Now, if you have your Bibles, now you can turn first. And we're going to go through quite a few scriptures today. We're going to go kind of quick. <clears throat> and we're going to be studying uh, kind of a part two of a message. We, some time ago, 
we did part one of a message we called the missing part of faith, which was how to rest. That faith is a rest, and most people don't know how to rest. So we're going to study today part two of the missing part of faith, which very I, I'm debating on whether to tell you right now what it is. I might as well go ahead because you're going to hear it sooner or later. Anyway. It is faithfulness. And we're going to talk about what faithfulness is. And I really want you to see some things because... This has never been more pertinent than today uh, in the church. The, the, there is so many in the body of Christ that are being led astray, that are just falling to doctrines of devils. And so we want to make sure that we are found faithful. And we're going to look at some of these today. So you can go to first to Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to go, like I said, to several scriptures. So we're going to move kind of quick. Revelation Chapter 12. In verse 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. They loved not their lives unto the death. Now, <clears throat> you can go ahead and go to the next scripture. I will also tell you what it is. It's Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to continue talking while you're turning. That last part of Revelation 12 said, They love not their lives unto the death. Today, Christianity, now of course the book of Revelation was written. Uh, it's at the end of the New Testament. And it, it was written by the Apostle John. And it was written during a time of, uh, well, while he was exiled to an island for being faithful to Christ. And there's the historical story, I guess we would say. Uh, it's not in the Bible itself, but it is recorded in church tradition that all the other apostles pretty much all died a violent death. They were all martyred for their faith. And it even came down to a point where they were going to kill John, and they were going to boil him in oil, which would be a pretty rough way to go. If, if there's a good way to go, but I don't know there is a good way to go, but that'd be a rough way to go. And they were going to boil him in oil, and they tried, and they couldn't kill him. And so finally they said, no, we'll just put him on this island until he dies, and just leave him there. So, in today's world of Christianity, people are about, tend to be, about as faithful to Christ as they are to one another. That's why the divorce rate is over 50%. That's why... There is so much excess of disease and all these things. A lot of it has to do with people who just aren't faithful. And I, I want to emphasize this. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is not, uh, this is not one of those, and I'm definitely not one of those kind of pastors that preach one of those kind of sermons where I'm trying to tell you to be faithful and be here every Sunday. And all. That's, that's not me. <clears throat> what I'm trying to exhort you to do is be faithful to Christ more than faithful to a building, more than faithful to a person, or faithful to you know, a, a, a ministry or anything else. Above everything else, it's to be faithful to Christ. Because when you leave this building, many times you leave, you go alone, you go back to your homes, you go wherever you go, and you don't always have another believer with you. But Christ is always there. And it's not that he's watching you and keeping a record and making marks for or against you. It's not like that. But he does see. And he always knows. And he knows when you confess him before men. He knows when you deny him before men. And so today's message is about being faithful. So we're going to look at this in detail. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 15. And it's kind of neat because reading this, being a somewhat of a charismatic Pentecostal church historian there's uh, whenever I read certain passages that are well known for sermons this is one of those times uh, back in the late 40s early 50s there was a young preacher that came out of Oklahoma named Oral Roberts and he preached a message that he called the fourth man the fourth man it was one of those tent revival sermons and we're going to use that same scripture today, that same passage. We're going to go over it very quickly. 
But I want you to see something because this is the missing part of faith, uh, a missing part. I don't know if we'll do any more. There may be other parts that we will see from time to time. But one of the missing parts of faith is just unconditional loyalty. Unconditional loyalty. Being faithful unto death is another way I would say it. But in Daniel chapter 3, verse 15, he starts, and this is talking about the Hebrew children, and most people know the story, don't necessarily know this is where it's at, but it says, Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Well, he shouldn't ask that question. <laughs> then it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Now, what, what they just answered, he said, if you don't worship like I tell you to, and you don't worship this image, then I will have you immediately cast into the fiery furnace right then, and you tell me what God is going to protect you. And then they wrote and said, well, king, uh, we're, not, we're not even going to give a second thought about answering you in this matter. Uh, as a matter of fact, if it's so that you do take us and throw us into the fiery furnace, because it was already given, they weren't going to bow. And he said, if that happens, then we have a, a God that can deliver us out of your hands. And watch, he says in verse 18, but if not, you hear what they just said? If you put us in the fiery furnace, God can deliver us. But if not, in other words, if we don't go into the fiery furnace, if, if God doesn't burn us up, in other words, if God doesn't deliver us, is what I'm trying to get to. I'm going, my, my mind's going in four different directions at the same time because I really want to jump into this. He said, our God will deliver us. But if he doesn't, you see, right then, in the camp that I came out of, that is, they'd have said right then, oh, don't expect to get it from God because you just wavered. There's no faith there. Because you said he'll deliver you, but if he doesn't, see, there's no faith. But you can't tell me these three Hebrew children, as they're called, weren't walking in faith. Matter of fact, they're even listed in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith. So what they were showing was a faithfulness that goes beyond words. It goes beyond a doctrine. It goes beyond a a camp. They were saying, God, they, they, they were telling this king, they said, we're not going to bow. See, when I think of this, I, I think of two things. Number one, I remember back in the 70s, 80s, I guess 80s, I had a bunch of the albums, that, that's the actual vinyl record albums, for some of you younger ones that don't know what those are. <laughs> And I had a bunch of records by this man named Keith Green. And he had one album that showed this very scene. And it showed when the king was coming through, all the people were dropped down and bowed down, and they had one guy standing there like this. I think it was standing like this, actually. He would not bow. So when I read this story, I automatically go back to that. And then, of course, the other thing that comes to my mind, which you, may, you wouldn't know about necessarily, was when I mentioned the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. About 20 some odd years ago, we lived on a goat farm. We had a farm, it was a little place out in the woods, and the house rent was cheap because they had goats on it. And if you parked your car in the front yard, the goats would climb on top of your car. And we had a couple of really tough goats <laughs> that I, I did battle with on a daily basis. <laughs> and they would lock their legs, I'd grab their horns, and we would see who would give in. And I think it was about 50 50. <laughs> but we had these three baby goats that were born, and we named them Meshach, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> so <laughs> automatically I think of that whenever I go back to this passage. <laughs> so <laughs> now 
But you have to realize these guys were going to die as far as everything looked. And this king says, you will bow or I'll take you right then. No judge, no jury. Uh, what do they call it? Rendition. Right? We just grab you, lock you away, no, no due, due justice or, or due process. There you go. No due process. Just We just pick you up, take you to prison right then. Now, I don't know if you realize or not, but <laughs> this isn't too far removed from today. Yeah. There's controversy right now over what can be done, setting aside due process. <clears throat> but these people, men of God, trusted God, and they said, King, we will not bow. Whether we live or whether we die, will you put us in there? We got a God that will save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow. Now, that was a deeper faith than just a statement of faith. That was deeper than just making a confession of faith. We got people today that will make a confession of faith or they'll believe for healing, so-called. And if it's not done in five minutes, then forget that. I'm going somewhere else, do something else, do something. You know, I, I, I prayed and asked God for a new car, and I didn't get it, so God must not be for real. That's the way people are today. Well, I want to talk about faithfulness, but I want to go beyond just the words of faith. I want to go beyond just confession of faith. Now, listen, I believe in confession. I believe in your profession of faith. I believe you should say what you believe. I believe that you should believe the Word of God, and you should say that. But there is something deeper here that we're talking about because we'll see several other scriptures and if I don't hurry, we're not going to get it done. <clears throat> but now notice, and this is the beauty of it, it said, <clears throat> verse 18, but if not, in other words, we have, a king, we have a God that will deliver us from your hand, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace, one, seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now you see the picture. The thing is so hot that the men that took them in there to throw them in die from the heat. And yet they throw them on into the fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And again, I could go in several directions here, but I want to tell you, first off, you got to make a stand. Faith is taking a stand. And they took that stand. Now, notice that stand did not keep them from going into the fiery furnace. They went right in the midst. It was so bad that it killed those that put them in there. And yet, while they were in there, they were not in there alone. That's one of the main points of today. No matter what you go through, Peter talks about this fiery trial. And I'm sure he was relating back to this idea, back to this story. And he's saying, don't, don't think it. Well, James said it too. He said, when you come into these various temptations and trials and all these things, and he said, these fiery trials that have come upon you, don't think you're the only ones. It's come upon all the others too. You're like everybody else. Nothing's hit you that hadn't hit everybody else. But know this. When you're in the midst of the fire, the Son of God is there with you. If you're faithful. If you're faithful. He says, <clears throat> well, actually, I want you to go to the next, next verse here. Go to Job. He said, Curry's preaching out of Job? Yes, I am. I know it's unusual. 
Job chapter 13. I'm going to show you these people. I'm going to show you what faith is. Faith is more than words. Job chapter 13 verse 15 says, Job is speaking, says, Though he slay me. Not usually words you hear from faith preachers. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. He shall also, he also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Though he slay me. I want you to get a hold of this today. I that we have to have a faithful spirit. We have to have the spirit of faith. Really, if you really want to talk about it, we talk about, well, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you, Acts 1.8. You shall receive power, ability, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And sometimes we forget the last part. And you'll be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. And the Greek word there is martyros. You'll be my martyrs. That's a witness. Several years ago, we went to Rome, and I got to preach Paul's gospel in Rome, possibly for the first time that it was preached there by him. Not sure. But we got to go to the Colosseum, see some of the places and different things and along the Appian Way and the, out to Ostia, see some of the ruins and some of the things that were there. And knowing somewhat about history, I knew that where we were walking among these ruins, and of course in the Colosseum, I knew that Christians had died there. It's reported that, especially that Nero actually used Christians like we use street lamps. That they would strap them up on poles and set them on fire and use it to light his way from where his ship would dock in Ostia to lead the way into Rome. And these were Christians who loved not their lives unto the death. If the church has ever needed the spirit of martyrdom, it needs it again today. You need to die now. So that if it comes time to die later, it won't even be a question. But if you don't die now, later it'll be a whole lot harder to make that decision. In... I'll, I'll give you a quick definition here. The definition of faithful means steadfast in affection or allegiance. Steadfast in affection or allegiance. To be firm in adherence to promises or in observance of duty. We need in the church today an entire new generation of people like, of course, like the apostles, like Jesus himself, but also what we're missing a lot of today is a, a group, a, a generation of people like Polycarp, Irenaeus, these people that are called the apostolic fathers or the early church fathers, these disciples of the apostles who had walked with the apostles and had learned a lot, had been with them a long time. The apostles were only with Jesus for about three years, three and a half to four years max. And then they lived sometimes 40, 50, 60 years later. And then the next generation came in. That's where Polycarp, and, who was a disciple of John and some of these other guys, and they were, had, they were with these apostles for years. And they had time to go into detail and study these things out. And they renounced the world for the most part and lived lives that were like wandering holy men, as we just about, like we would say. They really pretty much renounced everything and just spent their entire lives just thinking about God and praying and ministering and, and going into some of the what we call the deeper things of God. And these men spent their lives doing that. They didn't just sit down, fire up their computer, and click on Facebook or YouTube to see what the latest flavor of the day was concerning doctrine. These men lived it. 
They delved into it. They looked at the truth and they sorted things out. And they didn't just jump out and start saying it. They read a verse and just all of a sudden make a YouTube video and start saying what this is or what that is when they don't have a clue in the world what it's actually talking about. Faith. To be faithful. In the New Testament, it means to be trustworthy. It means to be trustful. It means to be believing. To be faithful or faithfully. It means to be sure and it means to, to be, and it's used to be true. Steadfast, solid, unmovable. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly, on purpose, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now notice, in verse 1, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. You cannot depart what you were never a part of. People are going to fall away from the faith. People are going to turn away. And it says in the last days, people's love is going to wax cold, and that's why they're going to turn away. Their love for what? Their love for God? Their love for their fellow man? Their love for truth? You know, some of the most vicious fighting that goes on right now is between Christians. You know? Uh, honestly, Facebook and some of that other stuff like that has, has been more used to bring division and fights than anything else among Christians in, in the last hundred years. Everything's a fight. People, nobody goes on there to try to sort through things. They basically go on looking for a fight. And if you say anything that doesn't even sound right, they want to jump on it and fight. And that's with other Christians. Whenever Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. Not even love for the world, but your love one for another. And yet it's the Christians that are on there fighting the most. Wouldn't surprise me that every now and then, the devil doesn't throw a person in there just to stir something up and then let the Christians fight it out. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, nevertheless, in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And notice the next part of this. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's pretty plain. If you're going to twist that, if you're going to see something else in it, you're going to have to twist it. Which is exactly what the verse I just read beforehand in 1 Timothy 4 is about. Doctrines of devils, seducing spirits. In verse 20 it says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart, and meet or useful or fit for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So apparently God wants you prepared unto every good work. Amen. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness. Now if you follow righteousness, that means you do righteous. He that is righteous, he that does righteousness is righteous, the Bible says. But now notice, but follow first righteousness. Also, follow faith. Also, follow charity and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. 
There are people that oppose themselves. People that are working against themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now notice, this is that <clears throat> whole passage here together. And these people, it says that they should be given repentance. And these are Christians that have gone astray. They've looked, they've gone into other doctrines, they've gone off into another path. <clears throat> they've apparently not departed from iniquity. That's why Paul is telling them to. So we know it's right to depart from iniquity. And he says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So there is a snare of the devil that can, that is, it is possible to even trip up people who claim to be Christian. Who are taken captive by him at his will. Why? It all goes right back to making sure that we stand firm, that we don't get mixed up in stuff that Christians have no business getting mixed up in. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul wrote, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. The faithful. Almost every introduction that Paul does in his letters, every time it says to the saints at this place, the saints at that place, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So if you're faithful in Christ anywhere, now if you were the saints in this city and faithful, that's good. But if you're faithful at all, then these letters are to you. And as we've said before, many times you have to look and see what was written and when and who were they talking to. All of this is written after the resurrection, of course, and was written to Christians. It's kind of funny, reminds me of a, I don't know, I make reference to it from time to time, the movie, the recent remake of the movie, The Alamo. They were trying to decide who was going to lead the troops in the Alamo. It was between Bowie and Travis. So they took a vote. Travis lost. And they, he threw a fit about it and says, well, you can only lead the volunteers because you're, you know, I, I'm actually a commissioned officer and I can, read, I can lead the regular army, but you, you can only lead the volunteers. And James Bowie reportedly asked him, said, well, don't like the outcome, so you change the, the rules. Is that it, Buck? That's pretty much what Christians have done. Don't like a verse. Oh, let's see if we can try to discount it somehow. Let's see if we can say, oh, 1 John, not for Christians. Oh, it's, not. it's in our Bible, but it's not for Christians. And James, oh, they hate James. Hate James. Why? Because he, he mentions that four-letter word, work. Colossians chapter 1 verse 2 says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Matthew 25 just trying to hit some things I'm going to bring this together here in just a moment Matthew 25 verse 19 this is normally known as the parable or the illustration of the talents verse 19 says after a long time the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them and so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done. You've done something good. He said, You good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents, and behold, I've gained other two talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done. Done is a word meaning something has happened and somebody did something. Done is the past tense of did or doing. Right? I'm just trying to say there had to be something done for, you, for him to say, Well done, you had to do something. Right? You don't, you don't get a well done for sitting back in your easy boy and twiddling your thumbs. That's not a well done. You're awful quiet. <clears throat> he says, You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. Matthew 24, verse 42 says, Watch therefore, 
For you know not what hour your Lord does come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so sitting, doing nothing. Is that what it says? So doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. You say, Curry, you're bouncing all over the New Testament. Yes, on purpose. I'm showing you this is not some isolated thing. This is all over the New Testament. And it wasn't all about Paul. I mean, you say, out of the mouth of Jesus, out of the mouth of Paul, out of the mouth of the Apostle John. Hadn't even got into James. Revelation 2.10, Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. Don't give in. I mean, imagine that. Be faithful unto death. Don't worry. You're going to be tried ten days, and then you're going to die. Don't worry. In ten days, it'll all be over. And if you are faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. If you're faithful, if you're steadfast, if you don't back off, if you don't think, well, you know, I can deny Christ. Because I can turn around then as soon as they let me go and I can repent and I can accept them again. That's the way people think. If they, now, that's of course if they even believe in repentance. Because now it's even wrong in some circles to even repent. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, steadfast, unmovable. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this cause <clears throat> have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. These are my ways that I teach in Christ, and I teach this in every church I go to. Now some are puffed up, as though I would not come to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, it's not in theological gymnastics, it's not in going in and picking out a scripture here and taking out a context and reading something else into it and changing the definitions of words just to fit your doctrine. <clears throat> but it is in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? It is commonly reported that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one of you should have his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. <clears throat> he said, you, you Corinthians, you think you got it all. You got power, you got tongues, you got interpretation, you got prophecies, you got all this stuff going on, and in the middle of that, and, and you're so puffed up over what you have going on in your services, and you don't even realize that the world out there is talking about you, about how you got fornication going on in the midst, and you talk about, oh, uh, well, we're, we're being led by the Spirit. Yeah, but not the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is first off the Spirit of holiness. Not the spirit of wantonness. Not the spirit of lasciviousness and, and, and riot. The Holy Spirit. And he said, you, you're puffed up. You think you have something. You think you've you got all these gifts. And he said, and you don't even realize, you should be mourning. 
that this is going on in your midst and this person should be removed out of the midst of the church. He said, verse 3, For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done this deed. Now notice what he's saying. He said, I, I'm, I've already judged. I'm not there in, in, in the flesh, but I'm there in spirit. And I hear what's going on. And he said at one time, he even told them, he said, and though I be absent from you, I'm, I'm watching your order. I'm watching your services in the spirit. And I know what's going on. I know who's causing the problem. And he said, here, he said, I've already judged just like I was there. And we're going to deal with this person. And he said, and he should have already been put out of the church. But since you didn't, I'm going to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So that hopefully he will repent and, be, and come back to Christ. And when he does, you guys let him back in. Which you had to write him later and say, let him in. He's repented. But now notice, all that was going on. And Paul even said, I turned him over to the destruction of his flesh. To Satan. Notice he didn't turn him over to God for the destruction of the flesh. Notice that Paul had to turn him over to Satan before Satan could get a hold of him. See, there's stuff we've never even talked about. We don't like it. You know why? Because it means there actually may be some stuff that has to be done. You know, there actually is discipline in the church. But it's always toward restoration. But there is discipline. And most people don't like that. You know, there are things, I have people come to me, well, write to me, come, uh, come by, write, email, you name it. And they'll say, uh, can I preach? Can I come there and preach? Can I come there? Uh, I operate in this gift, I operate in that gift. Uh, you know, uh, you, should, you should let me come in and let me minister. And just as I told the Bible school students the other day, the Bible is very clear. Know those who labor among you. Amen. And honestly, some of the ones that you do know, you wouldn't let labor among you. I have a responsibility for this church. The Bible says clearly that we are under shepherds, under Jesus Christ. That we are, it, it says for us as believers to not make the work of an overseer extra hard, but to, to make it where he does it gladly and not grudgingly. And I'm telling you, I do. I have, you know, none of you are a problem to me. All right? I mean, it's amazing. I, you know, honestly, if, I, if I'd have known that pastoring was this easy, I'd have done it a long time ago. <laughs> right? Well, I did try it a long time ago, and it wasn't that easy then. So, okay. But part of that is because most of you are pretty mature. I, I'm extremely pleased at how mature most of you are that I, that I know, especially. There's a, there's a level of maturity here that is not found in average churches, especially some of the ones I've been in. We are blessed. I think it, it, is, it seems as if God is putting together people who actually want to do something for him and he's putting together a team of people that actually want to go out and change the world. Amen. They don't want to just sit back and they don't want their diapers changed. You know? Or if they do, they want, to, they want to learn how to do it themselves. Amen? So I'm, I'm pleased. This is not a scolding message. This is a warning. The Bible says that we are to warn every man to be teaching them and warning them so that we can present them to Christ, perfect and blameless. We have the heat turned up in here right now, so hopefully you feel the fires of hell. Because <laughs> I'm... <laughs> I think we need to adjust that heat somewhere a little bit, because it's getting a little warm up here. So... <clears throat> so... But there are people I will never let preach. Not in this pulpit. Why? Because I have a responsibility for the people that come here that I have to make sure. Listen, it's not just the words. Listen to me. Listen carefully. You can teach anything. You, you, can, you can read a book and teach it. You teach what you may know. But that's not what goes on. This is like having a river running with water and a layer of oil on it. What you teach is not just what the people get. That that's just affects their head. See, you teach what you know, but you produce what you are. You get that? No matter what you're saying, 
your underlying spirit and nature and character will be reproduced in the people that adhere to what you say. People that by willingly coming here and submitting, just by, by being here and sitting here and listening, you are in a method or in a manner submitting to what goes on here. That's why it's important that you, you don't just go somewhere, but you actually find out what, what the people there are like because you will become like them. And a person can say one thing, and yet an entirely different thing can be produced in the congregation because the people, will, will, they'll teach what they know, but they will reproduce what they are. And there are people that have great words. And, and I'm not talking about bad words. You know, I'm not talking about wrong words. I'm talking about people that have right doctrine. But their character and their nature is not such that well, I would ever let them minister to you. You know, there are people that have amazing gifts of prophetic word and amazing uh, tongues and interpretation and, and prophecies and you know, all the, the gifts of the Spirit. But that doesn't, does not mean that I would let them minister to you. Why? Because it's not about having a gift. It's about what they would reproduce in you. And most of the time, the, the people that I know of that have approached me or that have been around like that, that... They want to merchandise the gift they've been given so that they can be somebody. And I never want you to get the idea that you want to be somebody. And if I let them minister, that's what they will give you. They might give you a good word, but they'll also give you a spirit where you'll want to be somebody. If anything, you should just want to die and decrease and let him increase. That's the key. So I'm very watchful over these things. So if somebody is in this pulpit, especially when I'm gone, we set up ahead of time who can come in and minister. It isn't a free-for-all. The people, my family and other people that are here, they'll know if, if these are the, this person is ministering. And if somebody else tries to take advantage of the fact that I'm gone or something, we'll shut you down that quick. Why? Because there is order in the body of Christ. So, just a warning. <laughs> don't, I don't want you to look foolish. Because that's what will happen. You will be shut down. There is a faithfulness. Thank you. <clears throat> there is a faithfulness that I'm talking about here. He says in Titus, chapter 1, verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, this is the Apostle Paul writing, that you should set in order the things that are wanting or missing and ordain elders in every city as I have had appointed thee. If any be blameless, notice an elder should be blameless. You hear that? You shouldn't be able to point at him and say, this thing, you know, uh, every time I try to get a hold of elder so-and-so, uh, they say, you know, he's... Off at the movies. Is there something wrong with movies? Depends on the movies. I could, just as a blanket statement, I could pretty much say, yeah, pretty much, yeah. You will get, from any movie you watch, the spirit that is the genre of the movie you're watching. Okay? <clears throat> For instance... If you go watch a comedy and you say, is there something wrong with a comedy? Depends. Most comedy now is a front for pushing the homosexual agenda because they can make such funny remarks out of situations like that. And what they do is get you laughing and then push in something on you and you'll put up with it and they'll do it three or four or five times and they'll see how long you'll put up with it. They do the same thing with sitcoms on television and everything else. If you, for another, it's another aspect. <clears throat> if you want the spirit of faith, you're going to have to be very picky about watching movies. Hollywood has not been given the mandate from heaven to give you faith. On the other hand, <clears throat> Hollywood has two major genres of movie. The two types of movies that make the most money for Hollywood 
One is well-known horror movies. The second is not talked about that much. It's called pornography. Those are the two biggest money-making genres of movies in Hollywood. Now, the pornography, that's pretty obvious. Christians shouldn't be uh, participating, indulging, watching, or anything else. You know, the Bible says you're not even... It says you're not only guilty if you do these things, but if you take pleasure in them that do them, you're guilty of their sin. You know the Bible says that? So you might want to take heed to what movies you actually enjoy. Because I promise you this, you watch horror movies, you will have a spirit of fear. And if you have a spirit of fear, every time you speak, you can say the exact words God gives you, and yet your spirit will mix. That's, see, under the, Old Testament, under the Old Testament, God spoke to a person. And they faithfully, hopefully, said exactly what God told them. So there wasn't really any mix. And that's why they said, you know, no, if, they don't, if it doesn't come to pass, kill them. Why? Because all they're doing is repeating what God said. And if they say something doesn't come to pass, then guess what? They're not repeating what God said. And they're saying God said it when he didn't. So just kill them. Right? Now, that was an extreme, and it wasn't always that case. But in the New Testament, it doesn't say kill them. It says judge the prophecy. Why? Because there is a mixture that takes place between the human spirit and the spirit of God that the spirit of God can start to minister, and the human spirit can kind of kick in, and you can have 90% God and 10% person, or you can have 10% God and 90% person. That's why you have to judge prophecies. So there has to come a place where at some point you start to be able to say this, you, you, you know these people because you get from them whatever they fill themselves with. This is very simple. People always ask me, how do I renew my mind? First thing is stop putting in garbage. That's the first step. Right? If you keep putting in garbage, it's going to take you longer to renew your mind. So the first thing is to stop the garbage. Right? Now, I will tell you point blank, no Christian at any time, at any place, ever should continue to call themselves Christian if they continue to participate and watch and feed on any films that have to do with especially overt sexuality or fear. It is that simple. I have a responsibility to warn you of where you're going, what road you're on. And I'm not telling you, oh, you know, you're damned to hell or anything. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to help you grow up to look like Jesus. The Apostle Paul even wrote to the Philippians and said, think on these things. Maybe that would be a good measure of what movies you could watch. What can you think on while you're watching that movie? Does that movie portray, portray things that are pure and holy and of good report? Or does it breed fear? Does it, does it cause you to have your conscience seared where you can watch blood and gore and people being dismembered, which is not the spirit of Christ, and yet it does nothing to you and you laugh about it? Oh, watch it. Oh, oh, it's good. Watch this. He's hiding behind the wall. Don't go in there. Uh-oh. Look behind the door. All that. It is amazing. The more you are one with Christ the more the things of the world make your spirit cringe. Make you grieve. Things that, 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 you know, like the prayer that I hear prayed often. Lord, break my heart with the things that break yours. He says, didn't get far enough just now. First Timothy, or I'm sorry, Titus. Titus 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. For if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Hmm. Now the word riot means excess. Children, so a person should have children, and their children should not be accused of excess. Okay? Or unruly, which means unsubdued or insubordinate. 
So an elder should have children who are subdued, and that is a perfect word for it, right? If you know children, you have to subdue them. <clears throat> Was it Susanna Wesley used to say, the first thing you must do in a child is break their will, <laughs> right? Because it's a battle. And if they do not learn to submit to you, they will never learn to submit to God. What will happen is the state will eventually make them submit if they, don't, if they do not learn to submit to authority. Now, <clears throat> notice though, it says this elder is supposed to have, be blameless, husband and one wife, have faithful children. Now, if he's supposed to have faithful children, he should also be faithful. And these children, they shouldn't be faithful when they're children. When they grow up, it doesn't matter anymore. You get that? Faithful children should grow up to be faithful men whom Paul talked about and said, be sure, Timothy, to pass this on to faithful men who will be faithful to pass it on to other faithful men. Why? What is faithful? Steadfast. Remember, I gave you the definition right at the beginning. Let me go back and read it. Faithful, trustworthy, trustful, believing. It means to be steadfast in affection and allegiance. Would you call a man faithful? If he only had an affair once a month. No, of course not. He wouldn't be faithful. Why? Because you have to be steadfast in your affections and in your allegiance. You get that? Steadfast in your affections and your allegiance. They should not waver. He says in Revelation chapter 2, we're getting there pretty quick now. Revelation chapter 2. Unto the, verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, now Ephesus, the glorious church, these things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now notice what he tells them. I know your works. Hmm. I guess God does take attention and have something to do with works. I guess he, I guess he does take notice of it. And your labor. So now it's got the works and your labor, and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake have labored. There it is again, labored, and hast not fainted. Hadn't quit, hadn't given up. Labored. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you have left your first love. Remember therefore, now watch, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Now he's talking to church, isn't he? Amen. He's telling the church to repent. And do the first works. Hear that? Do the first works. Or else. Do you ever know Jesus said or else? He did. He didn't say, oh, you know, just take a pen and paper and write down what you want to do and make that what you live by. He didn't say that. He said, do this or else. I will come unto you quickly and I will remove your candlestick out of his place, except you repent. But this thou hast, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You say, well, who's the Nicolaitans? Okay, let's look at it. Nicolaitanism. It was a heretical sect of early Christians, a group, uh, an offshoot, a cult, you would even say, of early Christians. Hippolytus of Rome states that the deacon, Nicholas, was the author of the heresy of the sect and the sect. Several early church fathers, including Irenaeus, Epiphanius, Theodoret, that's Theodoret, not deodorant, mentions this group. Irenaeus stated this. Now here's one of their definitions of how they lived. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. Pretty much anything goes. Why? Because nothing matters. Why? Because hadn't you heard? There's no sin anymore. Doesn't matter what a Christian does. Oh, uh, the world does it, it's sin. The Christian does it, not sin. Christians can't sin. Hadn't you heard the good news? So if I slap you, 
I didn't slap you. Okay. <clears throat> Curiously, the name Nicolaitans actually comes from the word Nicholas, which means victorious over the people. People who had gone into this cult, Satan had gained supremacy over them. Verse 7, he that hath an ear, still in Revelation chapter 2, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, is what I read earlier, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Verse 13, he says, I know your works. And where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast my name. In other words, you're right in the middle of where Satan's seat is, and you still hold my name fast. You've not denied me. And in, right after that, he says, and has not de denied my faith. You've been faithful. Even in those days, wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. Do you hear that? A martyr. He was martyred because he stood fast and didn't go along with everybody else, and was actually killed for his faith in Christ. That's what I'm talking about today. That kind of faithfulness. A faithfulness that will stand to the Word of God, will stand what the Word of God says, will stand for God, will stand for purity, holy, holiness, righteousness, truth. Even if it cost you. He says, but I have a few things against you because you have them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, and have taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Something you're always going to find here, because this goes right, well, I'll be reading it here in just a minute. You notice in verse 15 here, he says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He mentioned that twice. Second time he's mentioned them. But every time he mentions them, he says, That thing I hate. He said, you have this going on. He says in verse 16, repent or else I will come unto you quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says under the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in, that, and in the stone a new name written which no man knows saving he that receives it. Now do you realize all of this is in discussion with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Every bit of this has to do with him saying, you've got these people in the church there that are saying, you can live any way you want. You can do anything and it doesn't matter. Hadn't you heard the grace? And he says, and those people that have that doctrine, I hate that doctrine. That's what he said. And he said, they will repent or else I will come quickly. And fight against them. Now, this is stuff people don't like, but it's what it says. And he says in verse 19, 18, And unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Now, I think that's probably something we should listen to, right? This isn't the Apostle John that somebody's trying to write off. I can imagine how these apostles that walked with Jesus knew him. This is the, these people that walked with him. And people today... Not even so-called theologians. They hadn't even reached that level. And yet they have the gall to stand there and say, oh, ignore what the Apostle John wrote because he wasn't writing it to us. Well, if the shoe fits. You know, it, that's what gets me. People say, well, well, yeah, but I'm a Christian. Really, how do I know that? Well, because I say I am. Okay. But Jesus said, I'll know you by your fruit, not your words. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. Well, well, but he's not talking to us because, after all, look at, at this other thing over here. No. If the shoe fits, wear it. If you're doing what these people did, then it applies to you. Well, that would mean I'm not a Christian. Well, as you've said. <laughs> he 
he says, who has his, who's, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, verse 18, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works. He mentions works twice. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding. Now notice, here's something else you're always going to see in this. Here's what you're going to see. Anytime you have this doctrine of the Nicolaitans, you're going to see a couple of things. You're going to see loose living. You're going to see anything going on. You're going to see people where the, their, their big catch word is, oh, you shouldn't judge. That's what you're going to hear. Whenever the, Paul, when the, the Bible through Paul especially says, judge all things. He says here, now watch, here's the other thing you'll see. You'll see loose living. You'll see disorder in families. You'll see unruly children. Go into the whole list of things. And then he says, notwithstanding, now you might not see all of these in every situation, but you will see the majority of them. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, because you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess. Notice, calls herself. No one else has ever called her that, but she calls herself that. Which calls herself a prophetess. You, you suffer her to teach. Okay, that won't happen here. And to seduce my servants to commit fornication. Funny thing about Jezebel, she always seems to have a spirit of seduction. Always seems very um, seductive. <laughs> right? Always seems to have a spirit of lust. Something. And not always lust, but just seduction. Not the reality of it, but the temptation of it. Always seems to come across... Kind of coy, you know, just trying to advertise with no goods. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. Why? Because all of that has to do with spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication. That's what it is. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Notice he didn't say, well, <laughs> you really can't get away from repent with deeds. He says they had to repent of their deeds. So deeds count, and so does repentance. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches, now notice this, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Is that what it says? It does not say according to my works. You get that? Listen, you get to God because of Jesus' works. He's going to reward you according to your works. You get that? Jesus' works get you to God. That's by what he did, you get in the game. If you don't participate in what he did, if you don't... Now, and just let me, for the record, let me tell you, I'm not a law preacher. I know some people try to say that. And I'm not a grace preacher. I'm a gospel preacher. I preach the truth. I preach the word of God. I preach holiness. I preach righteousness. That's what I preach. I preach truth. I don't preach one group or the other. I'm not in any group. Somebody, well, <laughs> more want to exclude me rather than include me. But I will tell you this. I don't preach law. I would, will never preach that you get to God by doing good works. That is impossible. Right? But I will adamantly tell you that once you get to God through Jesus Christ, you are free to do all the good works you want to. And don't let anybody tell you that your good works are evil. Because that's what they're saying right now in, in churches around the world. They're saying, oh, if you do any works at all, it's evil. No, it's not. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. <clears throat> he says... Verse 24, but unto you I say and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none of the burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. 
and he that overcometh, and keep my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And you see what he's saying here? He said, I'm doing this. I'm going to do this. So the churches can know that I will reward you according to your works. He said, I'm going to do these things to Jezebel. I'm going to do all these things that are going on. Then he says, in Revelation 17, 14, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. What does faithful mean? Adherence. Right. Steadfast. And we know out of Galatians 5, I'm not going to read all this, but I am going to quote a couple of things here. He says, you did, in verse 7, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calls you. A little, little leaven leaven at the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubles you shall bear his judgment. Hear that? There is such a thing as judgment. Whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that you were I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. It doesn't get much plainer than that. But by love, serve one another. Your liberty is to be able to love one another, not for occasion of the flesh to do anything and say, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. Oh, it's already all been taken care of. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another... Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you are not walking in the Spirit. He says, For the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Here's the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, that's partying, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's about as plain as you can get. If you do those things, it shows that you are walking after the flesh and not after the spirit, and I don't care what you call yourself. Actually, you ought to call yourself a bad example, <laughs> especially if you call yourself a Christian. He says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Hear that? You can do all that you want. You can have all the faith you want. You can have all the meekness and temperance that you want. Now, temperance. Let's just stop there for a second. Do you know what temperance is? Self-control. That's what it is. Self-control. That means that you decide, I won't do this. I won't do that. I will do this. I won't do that. That's self-control. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Right? Not live any way you want. Which, as I always say, I live every way I want right now. And guess what? I want to live the way I'm living. How do I live? Righteous and holy. And I'm not relying on either, anything I do to get me to heaven. I rely on the blood of Jesus, and I, re I rely only on him to get me with the Father. But because I'm with the Father, then guess what? He has changed me to where I don't want to do those things. And if you still want to do those things, you are not changed. You may be a convicted sinner, but you're not a converted saint. See, that's the part we miss. There has to be something done in us that changes us from the way we were before. If you're not changed, you're still in bondage. He says, <clears throat> verse 24, And they that are Christ's, 
born of Christ, belong to Him, have crucified the flesh with its affections and lust. Let me read that again. And they that are Christ, belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, it doesn't matter. Oh, wait, that's not what it says. Hmm, yeah. You which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. So apparently you can fall away. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season... You hear that? Don't be weary in well-doing. You, you should continue to be doing well. You get that? You should be doing well things. You should be well-doing all the time. For in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are of the household of faith. We're talking about being faithful. We're talking about the Spirit of God dwelling in man. Being faithful to that spirit. But let me tell you something. This idea that we have today of what being faithful is. Apparently, well, number one, nobody even thinks about what it is. Not, not nobody. There are groups that don't even think in terms of being faithful. Matter of fact, they, they do just the opposite. And used to it was, oh yeah, let us, uh, you know, we're just going to keep doing what we want to do. And it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, oh yeah, let us sin more so grace can abound more. Oh, now it's even beyond that. Now there's no such thing as sin. Let me tell you, these books, Fox's Book of Martyrs, one called By Their Blood, Christian Martyrs from the 20th Century and Beyond. Look at this. Look how thick these things are. More Christians have been martyred for their faith in Christ in the 20th century than in any previous century and all previous centuries combined. The spirit of the world hates the spirit of Christ more now than it ever has. We can see things going on now more than ever before. We can see things shaping up in a certain way that I will tell you quickly. Get right. Stay right. You say, how do you stay right? You're relying on Him. It's Him. What you have committed to Him, He is, he is faithful to keep. He will keep you. He can protect you. He can keep you from falling. But there is a possibility of falling. It talks about in the end times that many will go this way and that way. Many will say this and many will say that. And he even says, many will say, oh, over here is the Christ. Oh, over there is the Christ. Well, let's, okay, Christ. That's, you know, we, we read that in kind of different ways. But let's be very clear. What they were saying is, oh, let's go over where the anointing is. Because that's what the word Christ means. The anointed one. Oh, let's go there. Why? Because they're anointed. We'll run over there and get their anointing. We'll go over there and hear what they got to say. We'll go over here and go over on this side. and Because they're anointed and these people are anointed. And they're going to run around and they're going to say it. And it says, don't go out after them. He says, why? Because they're going to, in these end times, people are not going to remain with sound doctrine. They're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears that will say whatever they want them to say. And there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. Amen. Saints, if there has ever been a time for us to be steadfast and faithful to the Word of God, it's now. Amen. It'd be such a shame to be one of the ones that the Word talks about when it says that 
even the elect could be deceived if it were possible. And because of that, he, he cuts the time short just so that they wouldn't. But imagine if those that are, those that do go after doctrines of devils, those that do give way to these things, those that, for whatever reason, depart from the faith. We don't want to be those people. Now listen, we need to pray. I'm not, listen, one of my uh, giftings, callings, whatever you want to call it, is to be able to search these things out and bring them out and lay them out clearly. And, and this was not that. This is not my answer to any teaching that's going out there. We're not there. I'm just trying to warn you now that we need to be faithful. I, I will present a clear-cut case at some future time, a complete teaching from A to Z on this thing, where we will take it piece by piece. But right now, I'm just trying to warn you. You need to watch. You need to take heed and let no man deceive you. You need to make sure that you need to examine yourself whether you be in the faith. This is a time for us to be solid on the Word of God. This is a time for us not to be wavering because we don't want to be those people. It says, except there come a great falling away first. We don't want to be part of that falling away. I'm absolutely convinced this is very likely it. This, this is, it, it, it may not be the... the it may not be the beginning of the end, but I think it is definitely the end of the beginning. Right, if you get the two there, okay. Amen. But this, I believe we're moving into an unprecedented time where we're going to see more and more of this kind of stuff. And even in the world, the things that are going around, everything is shake, shaping up to put the squeeze on people of faith in every realm. Economics, healthcare, uh, businesses, employers, everything is geared toward kind of hurting everyone into one direction. And if we're not vigilant, we won't even see it coming. But it's, it's time. We, listen, if nothing matters, then God owes an, an apology to every one of these people because they could have easily recanted and not had to die for faith in Christ. But I would pray The highest honor a Christian could have would be to be in this book someday. The highest honor. And very honestly, we're living in a day and a time when we might get that chance. Amen. But we must decide. You're not going to get that way by watching American idolatry. <laughs> You're not going to get strength of character by watching that garbage. And I'm not, I'm not just picking on that one. I'm saying it's time to sh shut the television off. Get your Bible out. Start reading it. Start praying. And these, these, these people that are preaching these, that are nothing more than doctrines of devils. Listen, they are not devils. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. They are deceived. You don't need to be arguing with them. When you see it, you need to pray Amen. for them that their eyes may be opened to the truth and that they will be recovered from the snare of the devil because they are opposing themselves. This is what we must do as Christians. We, listen, you, the most intolerant people in the world are the people that are preaching nothing matters. We must be people who pray for these people. We've got to show them the love of Christ. Grace has appeared at this time, to show us that we are to live righteous and holy lives, not wanton lives of looseness and lasciviousness, and let our liberties be taken to the point where we fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is a time, if you've never been serious before, this is a time to get serious. This is a time to focus and make those decisions. Dig in deep, because there is a, a a depth of the gospel that most of the church today has not even touched on. Amen. Now, I know this is one of those shouting, running, Jericho march sermons. But I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I would rather know something's coming and be prepared than to sleep until it knocks on my front door. Amen. So, 
we will continue to stand for truth, for holiness, for righteousness, not in our own power by any stretch. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, not in our works, not in anything else. But thanks be unto God, which allows us to do the works of Christ Amen. and to let our light shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's all stand up. <laughs> Father, I thank you that your word is true and that we do have your spirit and that your spirit, Lord, directs us and that as we give way to it, as we align our will with your will, that our eyes are even more open to see truth. Father, I thank you even now that these people that are under the sound of my voice, whether they be present in this location here or whether they be watching by internet or by DVD in the future or CD or MP3 or any other format. Father, I thank you that the spirit of truth, the spirit of holiness abides in them and that they hear, that they would have ears to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches and that they will draw closer to God every day that even now that they will in their hearts will be built a fire that begins to consume them for holiness and righteousness in the spirit of God Father I thank you even now that as I have preached your truth and you confirm your word with signs following that even now that the people will be freed sickness, of disease, mental ailments, of confusion, of anxieties, that these things must go in Jesus' name. Right now, I set them free in the name of Jesus to walk according to the calling that they've been called to. So, Father, we thank you. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray for all of those that are have been captured by the snare of the devil. We pray, Lord, that their eyes will be opened, that truth, your truth, will prevail, that their hearts will be turned, in many cases, back to you, Father, and that they may know the goodness of walking clean and holy before you, without bondages. So, Father, I thank you even now that their eyes are opened, and that your truth goes forth. I thank you, Father. And in Jesus' name, right now, Father, in Jesus' name, I say before all these people, right now, those watching, those listening, those here, that right now, as I pray, I want to pray a special prayer, a certain prayer, that if you agree with what I'm saying, that you also would voice that prayer. And mean it from your heart. Father, I thank you even now. So right now, in the name of Jesus, if this is you, which should be every Christian, then please repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, you who are in heaven, your name is holy. Right now, I've heard your truth. And right now, I decide to rededicate myself, to rededicate myself anew, and anew and refreshed. Today, Today starting, now, starting now, even now, even now I, set I set myself to walk in your ways, Father. Walk in your ways, Father. I, thank you I thank you that you have not just given me a spirit, you not not given me spirit. but you have given me your spirit. You've given me the spirit of holiness. Me the spirit of holiness. And, even now, and even now, I commit to you, Holy Father, that I will begin to recognize and discern, and discern the movings of that spirit, of that, spirit that, draw me closer, that draw me closer 
in holiness, in, holiness, in, righteousness. in righteousness. And I thank you now, I thank you now that, I that I can exhibit your spirit through good works, through good works that, were that were foreordained that I should walk in them. Father, I thank you that right now I rely on nothing of myself. I rely on the substitution of Jesus. I identify with him. He is my righteousness. He is my sanctification. He is my justification. And because of him, Father, we are one. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I would highly encourage you to dwell on this. Think about it. Go through. Check out the scriptures. We will have these uh, CDs and things available. Uh, usually we have them available pretty quick. If not, we'll have them by next Sunday. If you want to get it and go through it again, it wouldn't be bad to listen to fairly regularly. And let me just ask you here before I dismiss you. How many of you say this is your home church? This is, this is your home church. All right. Okay, how many of you, I guess I should say, how many of you are visitors? Visitors, ah, good to see you all, good to see you. Bless you, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, as we start to leave, would you all mind doing something? I want to do something a little different, and it won't take long. Well, uh, it's up to you how long it takes, okay? So, I'm not responsible for how long it takes. I learned this, or saw it, the first time when I went to Africa in 97. And it stuck with me ever since then. And I always thought, you know, someday, if God ever has me in the position pastoring a church, I would love to do this. So what, what we did over there is whenever I went over and ministered, and, we, and it was just a small building, and there was just the front door there. So when we started to leave, the first person out stopped at the door. And the next person that came past them, that person shook their hand, and then they stood next to them. And then the next person that came shook those two people's hands and stood next to them. And pretty soon, you got this line, and everybody's going by, and everybody shakes everybody's hand. And they ended up going in this big circle, and the way they did it was really neat. By the time they got to the end of the circle, everybody had shaken everybody else's hand. Didn't take long. What took a little bit longer after that was when they finished shaking everybody's hand, they stood out in the, no, it wasn't much of a parking lot. It was kind of an open field where we were at. But there were houses and everything next door. And they all stood around and for about 15 minutes just sang worship songs. It was the most amazing thing. And everybody around there, people come out of their houses and watched them and stood there and clapped with them and, it, but it was a witness to them. Now, I'm not saying we have to do all that today. We'll, we'll bring you into it easy, okay? But it, as you go, maybe whoever's, I know I'm supposed to be the first one back there at the door, but I don't know how they expect you to do that when you're the one farthest from the door. But if I get over there, I will stand there and shake hands and say hello because I want to meet you. I'd love to, to meet and greet you. Uh, and then as we stand, then we'll just shake hands. And if you want to get in line, fine. If you want to go on, you're, you're free to go. We are uh, going out on the uh, senior outreach. So if you're going to be doing that, then you do need to hang around. But still, get in line, shake hands, greet everybody. All right? Sound like something you would do? All right? It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it was a good experience. So um, other than that, God bless y'all. We will see y'all next, I guess, Wednesday, 630 or next Sunday. All right? So God bless. And I'm going to try